Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm like in Kichi. I can see me over here, but I don't know. Can you see me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to my sister in Kichi uh, for a very uplifting historical account. And uh, I really appreciate that, as I'm sure the, uh, the, the task force does as well. I'd like to start with highlighting some of my experiences that directly relate to the task force's charge. Although uh, all of my education experience and life experience actually does relate to and significant uh, relevancy. I worked at the United States Department of Justice Civil Rights Division Special Litigation Section from 1978 to 1981. One day I saw a poster while walking back to my office that had a picture of Uncle Sam pointing out at whoever's walking by with the cryptic words, black people, Uncle Sam owes you X trillion dollars. I leave the amount blank because I no longer remember the amount. I just remember it was trillions. My soul immediately responded, yes. I have been an active participant in the reparations movement for African descendants since that time. I'm a co-founding member, as Nkichi pointed out and is in my bio, of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, in COBRA. And I was co-chair of the National Conference of Black Lawyers in 1987 and 88 when NCOBRA organized. NCBL is a co-founding organization. After serving one term as founding co-chair of NCOBRA, I became the chair of its Legal Strategies Commission. In that capacity, I led a group of lawyers and activists in examining how litigation could be used to advance the demand for reparation. One of the things that we did in the beginning of NCOBRA, which was both not the legal, just the Legal Strategies Commission, but the whole of NCOBRA, was to reach out to the more mainstream organizations, because as Nkichi pointed out, many of the organizations that came to the fore, with the exception of NCBL, were longstanding organizations in what we would call the nationalist community or pan-African community. NCBL was kind of, you know, had some nationalists, but was not known as a nationalist organization. It was a black legal organization that had more left leaning than anything. But we reached out and we say we, I mean, members of the organization, Dorothy Benton Lewis was a member of the Deltas. He reached out to the Deltas and Deltas came on board. I was a member of NCBL, but one of my good friends was on the board of trustees of the National Bar Association. We reached out and they came on board. And there are many others, and I don't want to spend time doing that, but I want to support the view that in, in COBRA, broaden, broaden the groups and organizations, individuals that embrace reparations from a, 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 a call for a demand that was largely lodged in the nationalist community to one that began to be spread throughout the various communities, if you want to identify them by ideology. Randall Robinson's book in 1990, I think it was 1990, 1991, came out of that expansion. It was an excellent book, but it can't be looked at in isolation from the rise in interest. Uh, and we know across the country, universities, uh, churches across the country, everywhere, we're beginning to talk about it because as Nkichi pointed out, the work that was being done uh, largely by the Legislative Commission, but also in Car Cobra Broad Base uh, to take the, the, the demand into the public arena. As a practicing attorney with the US Department of Justice and the ACLU National Prison Project, I developed the skill of assessing the, the validity of claims made by prisoners and their supporters concerning conditions of confinement in state and federal prisons. I determined whether these claims, if true, violated the Constitution of the United States. I developed the skill of identifying what facts were needed to prove the constitutional violations that were asserted. As a law professor, I taught, among other courses, remedies at law and in equity. I taught students how to determine what relief is appropriate for any number of claims including claims for redress for injuries caused by historic violations. The starting point for my charge in this panel on the history of reparations is really to define the term. What are reparations? Black's Law Dictionary defines reparations as the redress of the injury amends for a wrong inflicted. 
United Nations resolutions and reports identify it as a remedy for wrongs to and injuries inflicted on a group based on their group identity. Examples of reparations to victims of the Jewish Holocaust in the state of Israel. Reparations to 15,000 former students of Canada's Indian residential school system. Reparations to the survivors of the British uh, torture, including sexual abuse and castration of the Mau Mau, and the internment of Japanese Americans in World War II by the United States. Reparations used in ordinary legal parlance means to provide the remedy that puts the person in the place she would have been, but for the injury. Money is only used when that is either what was taken or what was taken cannot be returned and its value is calculated. The matter you are addressing is whether and in what form reparations should take for slavery and legacy of slavery in California. That question was addressed as well in the United Nations resolutions and reports. I refer to these rather than documents of the United States because the United States has consistently resisted addressing the call for reparations and thus has no articulable docket doctrine on which on what it entails. Although I, as I mentioned later, we can draw something from Japanese American Restitution Act, the United Nations in the documents produced from the World Conference Against Racism, Xenophobia, and other related intolerances identified slavery as a crime against humanity and suggested remedies for the victims of crimes against humanity that included slavery. The 2019 report of the Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and, and Racial Intolerance addresses the human rights obligations in relation to reparations for racial discrimination rooted in slavery, the legacy of slavery. It's consistent with your charge under AB 3121. The special repertoire indicates that governments have a basic reparative obligation to make full reparations for injury caused by wrongful act committed by that government, whether material or moral. Her report also underscores the responsibility of governance to wipe out all consequences of the act and to reestablish the situation which would, in all probability, have existed if that act had not been committed through the provision of one or more of the forms of reparations. These forms are restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, satisfaction, and guarantee of non-repetition. The return of property taken either during slavery or based on processes that are the legacy of slavery is restitution, a form of reparations. Compensation for unpaid labor during slavery and the underpayment for labor that is a legacy of slavery is a form of reparations. The valuation of the return to Africa, the trip and establishing them in a country for those who were kidnapped and their descendants is restitution, a form of reparations. The Encobra Legal Strategy Commission studied slavery and its legacies and determined that there are five major injury areas, peoplehood, education, health, including mental health, criminal punishment, and economics, including that includes wealth and poverty. Peoplehood, the act of taking away the group's right to its language, family structure, and right to speak as a group. In 2022, voter suppression based on race flows from the injury to peoplehood. Education, the enslaver denied the right to learn. In many states, teaching an enslaved person to read was a crime. In other states, the learning was restricted. After enslavement, black schools had poor structural conditions and materials in those providing in, in quotes, white schools. There continued to be an, an, an inequalities in education based on the legacy of slavery. Health. The quality of health care during the enslavement was based on the value the so-called owner placed on the enslaved person. Volumes abound that document the racial disparities in health that can be attributed to the structural racism and the conditions of life of Black people, as well as discrimination in the provision of health care. These are legacies of slavery. Criminal punishment. The enslaved were at the mercy of whites who could punish them for any behavior they determined was offensive. Punishment was violence against the body generally. The foundation of the modern day police is the slave catchers. Law enforcement has a history of targeting black people and treating them more harshly. The legacy of slavery, wealth. The very nature of slavery was to force Africans to work for nothing. 
The exception to this, the rare occasions when an enslaved person received some payment for his or her work were largely at the discretion of the person who paid the enslaved person. Land that was rightfully owned was taken. And the continuing legacies that flow from slavery, including discrimination, education, employment, ability to buy property, have created a lower economic base for Black people, and it's a continuing legacy of slavery. Who is to be repaired? A lot in the, in, in the discussion about eligibility. The Incolver Legal Strategies Commission spent many hours discussing this question. The class of recipients of reparations for slavery and its legacy should include descendants of enslaved Africans and those who are suffering and those who are suffering the continuing harms from slavery's legacies because of being identified as Black, African-American, or African descendant. It is a misnomer and legally erroneous to call enslaved Africans enslaved African-Americans. Enslaved Africans were not citizens of this United States, as Nkichi has pointed out, until the passage of the 14th Amendment. This is not a preferential position. It is legally accurate position. The history of, of litigation in seeking reparations, I'm sorry that my, our sister Deidre former Pelman is not here to talk about the case that she led, but her testimony would have illustrated that the efforts to obtain reparations for slavery and its legacy through litigation have been primarily unsuccessful, with the, except for the very early cases that Nkichi lifted up. This is due to procedural hurdles. The legislatures and courts have adopted that the litigator must jump over in order to try the case on its merits. In, in, in Deidre's case, standing. Other cases, statute of limitations. The courts have recognized the principle, however, of providing relief for a continuing injury, one that traces back to the original harm. However, procedural hurdles must still be overcome. The Legal Strategies Commission also considered reparations as critical to healing racial divide created by enslavement and its continuing legacies. I have published an article about reparations as essential to establishing a true democracy. And when I send my narrative in full to the committee in the next day or so, I will attach some uh, my re re reference to the, those articles and others. The crime of slavery and its continuing legacy sit at the feet of the government. Slavery and its continuing legacies have targeted a group because its group identity is African, African descendant, or Black. This targeting has caused significant injury. The murder of the many Black people by the police throughout the United States, the differential treatment of Black people, as I've indicated above. Money reparations and only to descendants of Africans enslaved in the United States or in California, since you can't, you all can't do it for the whole United States, wish you could, uh, is an insult to the enslaved Africans as it diminishes the magnitude of the injury caused by enslavement. It also constricts the recipients of even those money reparations who to people who can somehow prove they are descendants of enslaved Africans. What about people who look like me, who cannot meet a standard of proof that they are descended from an enslaved African? Even more concerning, what about reparations for the legacy of slavery? Money reparations do not address a key charge of the legislation to address the legacy of slavery. And in addressing the legacy, the recipient group to have any credibility must be larger than those who can demonstrate they are descendants of enslaved Africans. People who look like me, but are not descended from enslaved Africans, suffer the injuries of the legacies of slavery. That is the major crime of slavery and its legacies. It imprinted on people who look like me, a presumption of inferiority, a presumption of criminality, a presumption of moral, loose morals, a presumption that leads to being unable to obtain jobs and housing of the same caliber as so-called whites. Money reparations to only those who meet a burden of proof of descending from an enslaved African leaves those who are victimized by the legacy of slavery with an injury without a remedy. Reparations must include systemic remedies, a blow to structural racism that is a child of slavery and the politics Pilot practices and pre beliefs that supported the kidnap, chaining, dehumanization of a people simply because whites saw them as objects of commerce that would increase their wealth simply because their skins were dark and their culture curious, simply because they were viewed as other, simply because. You have a challenge 
an obligation to look at this in whole cloth, to not be a victim of perspectives that devalue and diminish the injury to those, to the descendants of enslaved Africans and to African descendants more generally in California. The Legal Strategies Commission grappled with the question of the amount based on the concerns expressed to us that the check will be too big. Both individual checks to those descendants from enslaved Africans and the check needed to correct, remedy structural racism that is slavery's legacy. The legacy of slavery, structural racism in the major institutions and infrastructures in California continues to disadvantage Black people. I have an analogy that I'm not going to go into because you all know your personal budgets. You know how much money you bring in. And you know, those of us who try and be responsible do a budget. But there's some people, they, can't, they don't have enough money to do a budget. So they just hit, you know, whatever is the first thing on the table. But in budgeting, we put the whole cloth together. And then we look at our money and say, okay, I have to pay rent or buy, pay the mortgage. I have to buy food. And maybe the roof can wait till next year. So that's to me your charge, or maybe I'm giving you a charge, I don't know, but AB 3121, when he talks about the legacy of slavery and it talks about reparations for it, let's think, do the whole cloth. Don't narrow it before you even get started, which I'm sure you're not doing, but my passion for it and my concern is all the work we have done in Kichi, even before I joined in the mid 80s and others, she lifted up. We cannot cheat the ancestors, deny our, our children and those children to come the right to know the full scope of injury. And then you can, then reparations can be prioritized would be my suggestion based on what has to be done now and what doesn't have to be done now. And are there other ways of doing it? For example, in Virginia, in Maryland, they're doing a trail, a trail of, enslavement that shows where the various uh, uh, slave points were, enslave points, I don't like the word uh, slave, uh, and Mario Vidali taught us many years ago uh, that we were not slaves, we were enslaved. And slaves, it deteriorates our status as a human being. So then let's just look at, it seems to me, a full accounting of the injury honors our ancestors and African descendants. And Kishi lifted up the names and she did, I didn't, we didn't know she was going to do a libation, but thank you. Uh, well, and, and, and therefore the spirits of those who are now ancestors. There are others who have boldly lifted up this demand for 30 years or more, and there are those who have embraced it more recently. A decision on what will repair the injury cannot be made without the fullest record of the injury that can amass. And I know from talking to Dr. Grills and others that that's what you all are doing. That is why Encobra's Legal Strategy Commission spent a couple of years reviewing, discussing, and identifying the major injury areas. To us, it would have been irresponsible to simply say, give every African descendant a check for a certain amount. The compromise, what appears to be a compromise to me, in the Japanese American Restitution Act, is that all of those who were interned and alive at the time the bill was passed received a token payment, and I say token because it was a token, of $20,000 each. They received other forms of reparations as well, which may still may not have been adequate, but there were other forms. This was not a calculation of injury, the 20,000 individually, but a token payment. So once you have completed amassing the injury information, you can look at the definition of reparations and its forms provided both by the UN Special Rapporteur on Race, as well as other scholars and advocates, and determine what are the best forms of reparations to, or reparations to repair the injury. We know in law that it is difficult to make people whole and that money is frequently the substitute when what has been taken cannot be replaced. Yet we also know that the institutions that are the children of slavery and continuous legacy can and must be part of the reparative remedy. Remedy the legacies of slavery, the charge you have, requires you to consider the future African descendants and recommend reparations that will dismantle the structural racism that, as the esteemed Charles Ogletree said about criminal punishment system, is an unbroken chain from slavery. A check alone does not even touch the repair of the legacies of slavery. It does not think to repair, to eliminate the systems that have been put in place on the backs of slavery, to continue to treat African descendants as other, as subordinate to, to whites. We all know that the legacy continues. 
We know you have the courage to identify and, and clearly, uh, clearly this injury and then to recommend ways to repair these injuries. Much has been written by social scientists, health professionals, criminal punishment professional and experts, economists and more. We want you to, we, we praise you for taking on this charge. We praise you and honor you for, uh, you know, being willing to, to step forward and to do this very difficult task. Uh, and we ask uh, and, and that you consider us, those on the panel, and I'm sure other panelists, to be continuing resources to you. But we ask you to really look at the major injury that flows through all of the continuing racial discriminations that we experience is the injury of the lie of white supremacy and the lie of black inferiority. And that is what emboldened them to have slavery, to, to institute it against our people. And that's what emboldens them now. When they look at a black applicant for a job and they look at a white applicant for a job and they continue to do what was done to my father. Black applicant for a job in the 1940s during World War II at a, 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 a drug company, a bachelor's in chemistry, bachelor's in math, and he, the job was given to a white high school graduate. This is a continuing legacy. My family is descended from enslaved Africans, but I believe it would not be of service to only identify the beneficiaries of, of, of reparations as those who can trace their history back. Because we miss the point, the point that the United Nations documents talk about and that people are talking about. We miss the point of the legacy that must be attacked and must be addressed. Thank you very much for your time and your work.